Hi there. Uh, so I'm going to talk about an initiative that I started when I came to Stanford. Uh, I had, for many years, worked in local journalism, and um, one of the things that happens when you're when you're doing local journalism is you collect a local data set. You might use it for investigative journalism. And then when you're done, that data just gets lost. Even if you put it up on your website in a visualization or something like that, um, you know, you might have a website redesign. Something will happen. Somebody will move a server. And then the data that you, that you worked so hard to collect is gone. So that was one of my pet peeves. And I really felt like it was um, a problem because you can use that data over time to tell larger stories. The other thing that happens is that a lot of, like across the United States at least, there's very similar topics. I might want to look at use of force by police in Seattle, and I also might want to look at the same thing in a different city uh, or a different state. One of the projects that we did at the Seattle Times was one on court secrecy, where uh, judges were allowing cases to be completely hidden from the public view. And sometimes this involved unsafe products, medical devices, things like that, all kinds of things. Um, problems with uh, teachers who were abusing children, and lawyers who were taking advantages of clients. So we, we worked really hard to collect all of this data. And we could have done that, like you could do that story in almost any community in the United States. And so one of my hopes was that at Stanford, if we could create a space where we could collect all of that local data uh, from all of these disparate locations, then we could, um, we could aggregate it up, we could normalize it, and then we could tell the bigger story as well as the local story. So that's what I suggested when I first came to Stanford. It was this thing called big local news. So the first thing that I wanted to do was to see if I could get my students if I, to help out, because I wanted to test the theory. And so I had them go after police stop data for every state patrol. These are the state police in every state of the US, so 50 states. Uh, when, when you get stopped, they collect that information, and they collect your race, and ethnicity, and gender, and age, and the reason for the stop, if they searched you, if they found anything. So, so I. I put my students on, uh, on the task, and they came back with millions of records. Like, they used public records law. We got millions of records. And then I partnered with a professor at Stanford, and we, we created this thing called the Stanford Open Policing Project. And now we have 250 million records, 33 states, 57 cities. It's the largest policing repository, police stop repository of data in the US. It goes back about 10 years' worth of data. And we've trained about 200 journalists, and I'm really about 170, 75 journalists, on how to analyze the data and how to tell stories from the data. So, see if I can figure out how to. No, what am I? It's not. It's not moving. Oh, there we go. Okay, so now we have uh, graduate students, three staff. Um, and we, we archive all of our data with the library, so it's there forever. Once it's archived, we can get a persistent URL and turn it back out. Anybody can post it on their site and use it however they wish. We also work with data scientists in the School of Engineering to help us uh, because uh, they have really advanced skills and they can kind of help us teach data journalism at a whole new level. And then we built something called story recipes uh, using using a program called Workbench, which you could actually access if you Google uh, Workbench or CJ space Workbench, you'll find it. It's a free platform for analyzing data without having to know how to code. And it's a really useful platform. And so all of the data that we collect, you can open up into Workbench and then follow through with tutorials um, on how to analyze the data. So the open policing data, you can use R and really run some very advanced statistics, but you can also do the same thing in Workbench. Um, so some of the stories that we've done include looking at fires data. Forest fires are a big deal in California. I know here, too. Um, so we've collected, uh, the federal government had fire data going back 17 years. 
that every year was a different database. Every year they didn't, the database changed, and they didn't tell you how it changed. So we spent some time really cleaning it up, and now we're, we're working to release that data to journalists along, again, with story tutorials. And I've had my students do some stories out of it to just to show what's possible. So uh, the idea is that we'll create this national database of wildfires uh, that can be used, again, by any local journalist to tell stories. Um, this is an example of the open policing data. Uh, just in the spring, we trained 70 journalists on using the data. You can click it. Yeah. And, um, and we've done, there's been a lot of stories that have been done out of this data. So these are stories that would not have happened had we not gone through the effort of collecting all of this local data and, and normalizing it, aggregating it. So this, this particular project, um, the LA Times, used our methods and our statistical methods that the engineering uh, school developed new measures of discrimination, and they used that to write a story about the, the Los Angeles Police Department. Four days later, the police department completely changed their policy because they were so discriminatory in the way they were doing police stops. So they stopped, uh, they, they no longer stop people at random. They just won't do it. Because, because of this story. So that, that's an example of the kind of impact that we can have. Oh, we can go to one more. Could I, could this one? Test? Yes, sorry. Thank you. I'm, my clicking is not working. So. Uh, um, oh, oh, yes, okay. So, uh, okay, so that's, oh, that's better. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. I really do know how to use tech. Uh, this is a, another example of a project that we're working on. Uh, this is a, something called civil asset forfeiture. So if you're stopped by a police department um, and you have a lot of money on you, they might take it because they'll think, oh, that's a drug deal. And we think there's a drug deal going on because it's a lot of money. And, and you, they don't even have to prove it. They can just take it. And then you have to go through a laborious pro, you know, kind of process to get it back. Uh, and so this is called civil asset forfeiture. There are limits on it, but most local agencies, we think, are not really adhering to those limits. So we're collecting local asset forfeiture. How much is collected in every, every place where we can get it, every state, and then uh, going down to the county level in some places. And it's the same kind of process where if we can aggregate it up. And then we're also looking at how those police agencies are spending the money that they seize. And sometimes, you know, in some places it's like, uh, you know, ping pong tables or new trucks or things like that. And so it's, uh, it's a really good kind of project that we're in the middle of. In, in one case, this couple was going, uh, they were about to have a baby and they decided to have one last weekend, kind of a little spree at a casino. So they had a lot of cash on them and they got pulled over for speeding and the police officer seized $10,000 because they thought that there was you know, some illegal activity going on. And it was only after a newspaper covered that that they got their money back. So that's the kind of thing that we want to look at at a, at a broader level. We're also uh, pulling in pension data. So if you're a public employee, you have, your information is public record if you're going into a retirement system. So how much you make, how much you're going to get in retirement, um, all of those kinds of things. And so what happens in some cases is if I'm a, running a city, and I uh, retire, they'll sometimes in some systems they'll let you get rehired 30 days later under a slightly different title so that you can collect your pension, your retirement, and your salary at the same time, which really is not good for the pension, and it's being funded by taxpayers. So we're collecting pension data uh, from all of the states to see if we can track that kind of, that kind of information. But we're doing more than just kind of the projects. We're creating a platform. Right now it's, it's in what I call closed beta. We're testing it out. It's working. Um, and we're, we're building out an API so that you can open up uh, a lot of kind of tools from the platform. So what happens is you upload your data. You can share your data. You can create collaborative projects with other partners, whether they're with your newsroom or another newsroom. And it's all private. It's all in a private space just for journalists. And then you can use the API to open up and analyze your data in any number of platforms. Workbench, for example, uh, another tool called Dataset, 
Um, we have kind of some processing scripts to help clean and normalize the data, to label the data. So like if you have a data set and you want to say like a tomato is a fruit, broccoli is a vegetable, and you want to train that so that it will apply to, to all of the rows, you can do that with this, with this labor, labeler script. And you can do it right in the platform, um, which makes it just easier to kind of manage all of that work. Um, the Associated Press has a, a tool that they've launched this year called uh, Data Kit, and that's another one that, that just kind of helps you organize your projects. That's also something that you'll be able to access straight from the, the platform. The idea is to create a collaborative space to encourage it's kind of this big local model of journalism. So uh, a little later in the conference, I think Aaron Pilhoffer will be here and, and talking, and he, he's done a lot of data journalism and innovative work over the years, including creating something called Document Cloud, where you can share PDFs and documents. Um, so what he did was he basically termed this as Document Cloud for Data, and I think it's an apt description, um, but that's, that's kind of what we're trying to do. So uh, we're starting with you know, US data, but I, th I think it's something that anyone could access it and, and share information. That's it.